Jesse Galef. Take it away, Jesse. <laughs> Hello, denizens of Skepticon. Welcome, and thanks for coming in so early in the morning. I know 11, 11.15 is uh, pretty early after a wild night at Skepticon. But we have a, a panel here on how rationalists should approach relationships and marriage. Um, this is something I think all of us deal with at one point or another in our lives, trying to find relationships, figuring out marriage, figuring out the structure of our relationships. Um, and one of the things I really wanted to address with the panel is a common misconception that I think many of us have heard is that reason can't figure out love, that there's something beyond science, beyond uh, rationality, that love and relationships are just, you, can't, you have to take them on faith, and you can't figure them out. And that's, I think all of us would agree, absurd. And so I have here four fantastically intelligent, eloquent people. I'm really excited about this. Matt Dillahunty, Hannah Messenger, Adam Lee, and my sister Julia Gale, who you just saw giving a talk on rationality. Um, let's give him a hand and, and get right to it. Uh, if you guys could introduce yourselves, um, I guess starting with Matt. I'm Matt. <laughs> uh, I'm president of the Atheist Community of Austin and host of our Atheist Experience TV show. Um, I got married about a year or so ago, and I guess that qualifies, qualifies me for this panel. Other than that, that's it. I met my first Skepticon. Woo! My name is Hannah Messinger. I'm a fourth year mathematics major at the University of Chicago. I'm the president of our Secular Alliance, and I recently, with um, some colleagues, ran Carl Sagan Day Chicago, uh, which went very well. <laughs> and. I'm really excited to be here. I also have the honor of being the least famous person on this panel. <laughs> Hannah, what did you do to celebrate Carl Sagan Day? <laughs> we had apple pie from scratch. <laughs> no Cosmos because the school didn't allow us to have alcohol. But then we had three wonderful speakers talk to us about the amazingness of science. Cool. Oh, sorry. I forgot what Hi, I'm Adam Lee, author of Blog Daylight Atheism, and also the book of the same title, which you can buy if you like, no pressure. <laughs> and um, like Matt, I'm married. I got married about two years ago in a Unitarian Universalist church. So I guess that qualifies me to have an opinion on this topic. It qualifies your wife. <laughs> Uh, I'm Julia, in case any of you just came in. I am the president of an organization called the Center for Applied Rationality that teaches people about uh, decision making and how to make better decisions. And I'm the host of the podcast, or the co-host of the podcast, Rationally Speaking. Um, and I just wanted to share that I, I did an interview uh, for the documentary they're doing about Skepticon. And one of the questions they asked me was, you know, do you feel nervous or, you know, insecure when you speak publicly about atheism? And I said, no, no, not at all. Like, I, you know, have the good fortune of having always lived among, you know, solidly secular empiricist uh, communities. Um, but I am doing a panel tomorrow on relationships and marriage, which I've never talked about publicly. So that's the thing that I'm nervous about. <laughs> so yeah, this marks my debut talking about love in public. <laughs> All right, let's welcome the speakers. Um. <laughs> uh, let's start with the, one of the ways I like to delve onto topics and talk about some of the ways people often get it wrong. Um, what do you think some of the most common cliches and un unexamined beliefs are that you think are wrong about love and relationships? Um, so Julia actually gave a talk at the last Skepticon that I thought bears on this topic. She called it the straw Vulcan about this very um, narrow and artificially restricted view of rationality. Oh, Can you hear me now? OK. Thank you. Uh, so I, I was saying Julia gave a talk at the last Skepticon, I think, that bears on this subject, which is the idea of this, this straw Vulcan, sort of artificial, narrow, um, restricted view of rationality. And I think one of the common fallacies that enters into relationships when you try to apply reason to them is the idea that there is a, a right way to do a relationship, that there's a set of rules 
and you just have to learn what they are and you can follow these rules and then the other person is obliged to date you or to sleep with you or to marry you. Um, I think that there are, I, I spoke in my talk about this class I do called Epistemic Spring Cleaning and how there are all of these unexamined beliefs that we have that you know we picked up somewhere as children or from fiction or just from the you know culture we live in and never really examined, but they shape the way that we make important life decisions. And I think, uh, and I've noticed that uh, beliefs about relationships and love and sex and marriage are uh, solidly represented among the unexamined beliefs that we've uh, you know uncovered in epistemic spring cleaning. Um, just one example, I think, is the belief that you only find love when you're not looking for it, which is, like, I know people who believe this, um, and you know, I have various theories about where they might have internalized this, um, but it's definitely harmful, you know, if you have limited time to find someone you're really compatible with. Um, and then, you know, fiction is, is definitely a common source of cached belief, so it's just so easy to pick up expectations and ideas about how you know, relationships are supposed to go or what love is supposed to be from fiction. And because when you watch a movie or read a novel, you're not in the, in the frame of mind of, I'm hearing an argument that I need to examine, um, it's very easy for those expectations to just sort of seep into your brain and shape the way you view the world and the decisions that you make without you ever thinking about it. Love conquers all. <laughs> Not, not precisely. Um, there are other factors in one's life. And uh, as Julia said, we, we may fall in love more than once, and they can't all conquer each other. So <laughs> we have to have some way of making good decisions about love. I've talked about before how I think um, religion poisons people and then offers them the antidote. Um, and I think that we do that even without religion within our culture giving people these false ideas about relationships um, and then hoping that they can find the antidote. This idea that you, there's a soulmate or one person for everybody or one person who's the perfect match. Um, and we also tend to portray relationships as if they're, they're kind of uh, magical. And um, while, while mine is magical, <laughs> um, I, I think there's a lot more to it than that, and we build up false expectations in people and don't give them the tools that they need to be able to handle the difficulties that come with a relationship. What do you think are some good examples of corrections? Um, I know, Julia, you talked about works of fiction being particularly bad at creating these unexamined beliefs that are false and harmful. Uh, can you think of any good examples that teach proper lessons? Um, Matt, you also mentioned religion teaching a lot of these ideas. Uh, especially poorly, do humanistic communities do it better? Do humanistic works of fiction do a better job? I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's, I'm, I'm kind of new to the married thing, but I've watched the relationships in the groups that I've been involved with, and I think that by and large, in this anecdotal <laughs> sampling that I have, we are doing it better. Um, I think that you know, the, while there's still a lot to learn and a lot to teach people, the people that I've met in these secular communities uh, tend to have kind of a better grasp on the realities of relationships, but not all of them. <laughs> and I, I think part of that is that among um, humanist communities, there's at least more of a tendency to say that marriage and relationships can be more individual, that we don't make everyone conform to this one-size-fits-all model that's so common in religion that doesn't actually work for a lot of people. Um, I think it works best to look at real-life examples for inspiration. At least then you know that the thing that you're using to inspire you actually happened at least once, <laughs> so there's more of a chance of you being able to achieve it yourself than you know, if you were modeling after a fictional story. Um, I find my parents' marriage really inspirational. Um, yesterday I read a uh, a passage, I think, from an interview with uh, Carl Sagan's wife uh, that made me tear up uh, talking about the bond that they had with each other and how they, how lucky they felt to have found each other. I'm not going to do it justice, there's no way, but um, you know, that's a, a pretty inspirational real life relationship. So a few things. Obviously we have uh, Tim Minchins, um, if I didn't have you. <laughs> 
is a, a brilliant analysis of, of the or excoriation, really, of the idea of a soulmate. But for me, I, I really didn't find those real life examples. Um, so I, I've often turned to fiction. Uh, one example is John Green's Paper Towns is a young adult book um, in which he really, through fiction, examines this, uh, this archetype that I think we all know well of the manic pixie dream girl, right? Brooding, soulful young man trying to find himself encounters this delight, this, one, this girl who's, who's more, more fiction than real, who um, brings to him light and life. This is Garden State. This is like 500 days of summer before he finds out that it's not true, et cetera. Um, and I think that really does it justice. Um, and then this is separate. Does anyone watch How I Met Your Mother? Yes. So one of my favorite things, it's, you know, whatever, there are flaws to the show, but um, in terms of sex positivity, in terms of seeing sex, especially in married life, as like normal and great and wonderful, is that um, Marshall and Lily, a married couple, when they talk about their sex lives in a bar in public, they high five each other. <laughs> and I think that's just great. Like, they're just happy about it, and we all should be too. Um, I'm really glad you brought up Tim Mitchens, uh, If I Didn't Have You, that's uh, such a fun example. You know, if I didn't have you, I would probably have somebody else. And statistically <laughs> speaking, there are other people as good as you are. Um, I think that's a, while very probably true, uh, is there a danger of either sounding or being too analytical? in approaching relationships? Uh, is there a risk of that applying rationality to relationships is actually a bad thing? What are the harms, uh, the costs, and risks versus the benefits of this? I, I can think of several ways in which it could be harmful. I mean, I, I, I think definitely the optimal amount is of, of analysis and your love life is greater than zero, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you that uh, everything should always be analyzed and that will always make you better off. Um, one way in which it could make you worse off is if the person you're dating does not find analysis romantic. <laughs> um, that could definitely be bad for your relationship and often is. And, uh, but there's, I mean, there's other channels as well. Like, I've read some interesting analyses of, um, I guess, evolutionary psychology would be the right classification um, that suggests that, you know, Maybe the, you would think the rational strategy in choosing a mate would be to uh, you know, enjoy the mate you're with, but if someone comes along who is better on like, the dimensions that you care about, then you should just you know, transfer your affection to that person. Um, and you know, if, if the mate that you're with thinks that or knows that you have a view of love that, that works that way, then... You know, they're not going to feel very secure. They're not really going to be uh, that inclined to invest very much time and energy in the relationship with you. And so it can, like, from that perspective, the rational strategy might actually be to uh, fake, or if you can't convincingly fake, fake actually adopt uh, a view of love that's uh, immune to any considerations of someone else being better for you than your current partner. Um, so this was sort of an, an explanation of how uh, what some people call irrationalities in love might have arisen. That it's sort of a game, uh, it was a game theoretic way for our genes to uh, get people to stick around with us because we seem like the kind of people, you know, who wouldn't leave if a better prospect came along. I just wanted to say about that song, uh, If I Didn't Have You, my wife and I always agree that when you, whenever you start dating a new person, the first thing you should do is show them that song and if they don't laugh, don't go out with them. <laughs> And I, I like that point about there's, there's such a thing as over-analysis. So you can analyze or you can over-analyze. And you can, you know, if you're dating someone, you can, make a, you can make a list of their positives or their negatives. I think Charles Darwin famously did this when he was trying to decide whether to marry his wife. I'm so embarrassed for him. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think, you know, the dilemma is, am I, it depends on what your expectations are. Am I looking for someone who's perfect, who's, who will match me in every way, you know, who's my perfect soulmate, who will make me happy? And I don't... I don't think there is such a thing. I think any person you could possibly date or marry, there will always be personality differences and personality clashes. And I think there comes a point, you know, you can analyze up to a point and say, I think I'm compatible enough with this person to work it out. And not be chasing forever that one perfect soulmate who you just know will complete you in every possible way because I don't think there is such a thing. 
So in addition to the whether or not they agree on everything and figuring out the analysis, uh, I don't know how many people know this, but I'm kind of an anal analytic person. And um, I, uh, I, I discovered very quickly that um, when my wife says something that's wrong, <laughs> it's best if I don't just assume she's a caller to the show. <clears throat> <laughs> Um, one of the things that I think you have to look at is, do you even understand your own desires well enough to know whether, you, whether or not you're finding the person that fits well enough with you? How much analysis do you do? Do you bother doing any? Is, I don't hold to this idea that, um, that love and emotional attachments have to be separate from reason. I think we can rationally assess those things. I'm, I know for a fact that during the time uh, we were dating and you know considering being married, I know there were days where I was like, you know, this would be a good tax break. Um, <laughs> you, know, I, you run through those things in your head. Well, I don't see anything wrong with it. It doesn't diminish how much I actually love her. And if it turned out that there were a lot of bad reasons for us to be together, that doesn't necessarily mean that it outweighs the happiness that I experience by being with her. This idea that somebody else might come along and you have to trans, I think Julia said transfer your affections, um, which I know some people definitely look at it that way. I'm not convinced that that's actually uh, the only option either, that I may have enough affection for, or, or different affections for different people. So I don't necessarily have to transfer that. I do, I do deny this thing that uh, love is limitless because uh, you know, as much as I love all the people who uh, write in and enjoy the show, uh, I really don't have the emotional capacity to love thousands and, you know, of people. Uh, like you mentioned in your talk about the, the ability of the, of the brain to uh, produce enough neurotransmitters to, or, uh, to, to care for 100,000 losses versus one, but yeah. So Jesse asked about um, whether you can be over-rational or over-analyzed. And I think it's important to split it up into two questions. Um, there's the questions you ask yourself. Am I doing this right? Is this the right relationship for me? Am I happy? And certainly you can ask yourself that so much that you, you, you kind of, you're, par you're paralyzed in, in indecision, and that's a problem. But I don't think you can be over-rational in that. I have trouble thinking about over-rationality at all, frankly. Um, if the analysis is too much, rationally, you should stop. Um, but it's never wrong to ask yourself whether you're still happy. Um, Julia told us about status quo bias earlier. That's really strong in relationships. We know that people think that they will be happier in a relationship than alone, no matter what. Not all else equal, but no matter what. And so to continually ask if you and your partner or multiple partners are both happiest in that relationship rather than any options you currently have, I think is still really important. And then when you're asking, questions of each other when you're talking in a relationship, whether or not you can be over-rational. Um, to mention again Julia's talk from last year, uh, the straw Vulcan. I think one of the reasons that people think that the straw Vulcan is so unappealing is actually not even because they make classic rationalist mistakes and therefore are not rational, but because they frame things so poorly. They talk like you're a game that they have to figure out. They act as if the world is a machine. And I don't believe that rationality works that way. I think that we use rationality to make our lives better and to make our partners' lives better. I use rationality in my relationships because I care about my partners deeply, because I care about my own well-being deeply. Um, and if we frame it that way, if we say things aren't working, yes, let's negotiate our needs and wants, but not like, I can't even, I don't watch that much TV, but like <laughs> as if we're exchanging uh, tokens, right? Like this is my token of I get, you know, three hugs a day and this is yours and we'll exchange them, but rather we really care about each other and want this to work and we know that rationality is the best way to achieve our goals, why wouldn't we use it? Uh, just to follow up on that, I'm so glad you made that distinction between rationality and analysis. Because um, I, when I answered the question, I was thinking, I guess, of analysis, but um, I'm completely on the same page as Hana about rationality the way the, the word rationality is used, like formally in cognitive science, and the way I and, and Hannah tend to use it, it just means you know I, either the the best way to reason given the evidence you have, or the best way to achieve your goals, whatever your goals are. Um, and so you know if if using too much analysis is bad for achieving your goals, then it is not the rational strategy. And the rational strategy is instead going to be uh, being smart about you know when to use 
gut judgment and emotional cues and when to use analysis, you know, and when to override one with the other. I think there, um, there are some books I've read about neurology that say some people who have certain highly specific kinds of brain damage kind of lose the ability to link emotions to rational analysis. And what happens is they become paralyzed by options because no matter what choice there is, they, they can think of some reasons to do one and some reasons to do the other, and they just can't commit to one or the other. Like, I think um, Antonio Damasio has a book where he talks about this, where one of his patients, he said, do you want to come in for your next appointment next Tuesday or the week after? And the, the man pulled out his appointment book and he started debating, well, you know, on this day I wanted to go food shopping, on this day I had some other errands to run, and he would have, and uh, Damasio said he would have done this for hours if I hadn't interrupted him. And I think, I think the role that emotions play is to sort of to serve as a cutoff point to rationality to say I think I've optimized enough. I think this is the point where I can stop and I just have to pick something. Hmm. Oh, sorry. Just add one more thing. Um, I think the reason that people often think analysis doesn't fit in considerations of love and the reason why sometimes people use analysis poorly in considerations of love is that, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you a story. There's a, a study uh, in which psychologists asked two groups of people to pick a car that they wanted to buy. And, but the first group, the psychologist instructed, just go with your gut, whatever you know, the first car is that you really feel you want to buy, go with that. Or I don't know, consider all the cars and then just pick the one that you feel the best about intuitively. And then the other group, the psychologist instructed to do a cost benefit analysis to like, m list all of the important considerations like mileage and price and safety uh, and cost, or yeah, price, and then you know, pick the car that measured up the best according to that analysis. And six months or 12 months later, the people who had made their decision using their gut were actually happier with their car. And the interpretation of this uh, is not that it, analysis it, you know, fails across the board, but that when people do analyses, they often neglect the things that aren't easy to quantify, like how much do I enjoy being in this car? But that's a really important factor in how happy you're gonna end up being with your choice. And I can imagine that love would work the same way. That, you know, if people think that they, you know, should be doing an analysis of love or of, you know, what relationship they should be in, it's, uh, it somehow doesn't feel natural or doesn't feel like you're supposed to, uh, or maybe it's just not obvious how to quantify or how to weigh things like you're feeling about the person, but that's obviously incredibly crucial. Yeah. I this has taken us into at least three or four of the questions that I wanted to ask. So I'm going to try to pick one um, and stick with the current topic. How do we reconcile that intuition, the emotions and the analysis? Uh, I think it was Hume famously said that reason must be a slave to the passions. But clearly, there are some ways that emotion can lead us astray, some emotions that we do think would be a bad idea to act on, uh, especially in love. So how do these? relate to each other and how do you find a balance between going with your gut and your emotion on things like, well, this seems like a good partner and taking it too far with, well, I'm extraordinarily jealous and angry about this or I'm head over heels and I think I'll stand outside their window with a boom box, <laughs> which personally I think is a little creepy. <laughs> but what is taking it too far and how do we figure out how to reconcile these two drives? It might be the only place that I know or think that I disagree with Hume is about reason being a slave to the passions. Um, although I might be misunderstanding what he actually meant. I've, I've talked before about how we live our lives primarily by inference and induction. We are in the process constantly of training our gut to make better decisions. And we do that through the at continued application of reason and rationality. Um, so I. That, that part, I think, is kind of backwards. And so I, I'm in agreement with Hannah about the, the idea that we, we need to apply rationality to everything. Uh, and I, I can't even believe I'm having to say that. I mean, it just <laughs> seems so intuitive. But this idea that I don't think this, I don't think it, uh, it separates from the emotions. We talk a lot about, and, and I'll speak some tomorrow, about in debates when people are making emotional arguments, and I was asked about this yesterday. Um, I love emotions, and I'm fine f with uh, making emotional arguments as long as they don't sacrifice the actual merits of the case, as long as they're not fallacious and leading you in the wrong direction. So uh, I, I can't give you a toolkit for how to 
to strike that balance um, other than to use your gut and to keep trying to train your gut to do a better job. Um, so I think, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think when you meant balance emotions and reason, I think a different way to frame the question would be to sort of frame like short-term emotions, like I really want to go stand outside in the rain with a boombox, an emotion I can safely say I've never had, um, <laughs> and long-term emotions, like I don't want to get hypothermia. I, want this person to like me and not think I'm a creepy stalker because they, I didn't know their address before and I just looked it up, um, et cetera. Um, and I think a, a really interesting way to do this is to come up with your own uh, red flags, if you will. Things that, that's a bad term because that, that makes it sound like they're all bad. Uh, just pins, right? Things that when you reach them require more thought, require you to, to sit back. And the things that are safer, you can trust your gut more on because like cars, perhaps, the drive will go better that way. Um, so things like, um, I'm thinking, especially for people who are sort of younger, uh, maybe in high school or middle school, when you're thinking about things like first times, right? Those are emotionally fraught. Those are things to think more about. Those are not things to make gut decisions on. Whether or not to go to the movies with someone maybe is a safer choice. You can back out if you need to. You can leave. You can call your mom, et cetera. And when you get older, those, the same kind of things apply. When you're thinking about whether to move in with someone, I would pin that, right? I would think of that more. Whereas uh, decisions that have lesser weight, you can sort of trust your gut more on. And so to think about those things beforehand so that you know when you hit those that this requires more analysis. Um, so it's probably a, a solid plan. Yeah, I, I think that the role that rationality can best serve in a relationship is sort of establishing the parameters of what you're willing to accept or to not accept. Like, Shana, you mentioned green flags, and you can, you know, red flags, green flags, that kind of thing, like, if a person does X, Y, or Z, then I know that they're probably bad for me, or if a person does these things, then I know they're probably good for me. But I, I think we shouldn't discount the role of intuition, like with the cars example. Um, there's, an, there's an anecdote in that book, Blink, about how uh, students were asked to rate college professors based on, I believe, a 30-second clip of them teaching. So really, nothing, you couldn't draw any conclusions about their educational style, all you could really do is make a gut decision about you know, their, their aspect, their presentation. And it turns out that people who rate professors based on these very brief video clips, their ratings tend to correlate pretty well with people who've been in their classes for the whole semester. So you could either take that to mean that people are incredibly accurate at forming intuitive gut decisions, or you could say that people form a gut decision in the first few minutes, they meet someone and then stick with it no matter what the subsequent evidence is. <laughs> So I, I think where rationality really comes in is to say, you know, these are the things I'm willing to accept in a relationship. These are the things I'm not willing to accept in a relationship. And once you've sort of made those rules for yourself, then I think you should go out and look for people and see if, you know, people who fit those rules and who also give you a good gut feeling, I think those are the keepers. I see the relationship between analysis and intuition or analysis and emotion as being like just this sort of iterative back and forth that you continue until you reach kind of an equilibrium. Um, so for example, your starting point might be, um, I like, feel jealousy at the idea of you know, my partner having a, a friend of the opposite sex or you know, whatever sex they're attracted to. Um, and, and so that's your initial like, emotional judgment and then you can, you can you know, feed that into your ability to analyze and ask yourself, okay, why do I feel this way? Like is there, is it because, and then you can do thought experiments to figure out why you feel jealousy. You know, is it fear of losing your partner? Is it fear of being compared and, and you know, being judged to be inferior in some way? Um, is it fear of, of like looking bad to other people? Or is it just, do you have like an unexamined belief that it's bad for your partner to you know, have friends of the, the opposite sex? That, you know, where, and then you can ask yourself where that came from and if you actually endorse it consciously now that you're thinking about it. So you can go through this whole process and you know, oftentimes, I think more often than most people assume off the bat, your actual emotion can change once you've really subjected it to investigation. Um, but then sometimes you also end up at the point where you're just like, I just feel really badly about this and that's just a sort of fundamental thing and you know, I, can't, I can't explain it in terms of other things, I can't you know, change that emotion um, you know, by reasoning with myself. And so then the rational thing is to say, okay, I'm going to work with that. And you know, what's the best that I can do given that I have this emotional reaction? What choices would, would work out best for me? Um, so 
you know, it's just sort of a, it's just sort of a back and forth uh, feedback cycle between uh, intuition and reason until you find the best strategy for you. Yeah, I just want to add, I think that's a really good point, and I think that's one of the other um, instances in which really thinking about what you're doing is warranted, whereas in other times you can think a little less, is when you have patterns uh, of things that don't work out in your relationships, jealousy being a prime example. If this is something that comes up for you, or you know comes up for humans in general, right? You can crowdsource uh, difficulties, then it's really good idea to examine uh, those problems that arise frequently, because maybe there's a solution that will then have enormous effect on yours, and if you speak to a large group of people, other people's relationships as well. Um, we've been touching a lot on the idea that uh, we don't necessarily know our values or our preferences, uh, and that they can change, both intentionally and over time. Uh, how does that affect a relationship status, um, especially with commitments like marriage and um, public statements of going steady, uh, Boyfriend, girlfriend, these are things. Where are you from? <laughs> I'm from the, the 90s, thank you. Getting pinned. Uh, getting pinned, even better. Um, how does this fit with the dynamic that we often don't know what we want or what we want changes over time? Uh, how can you overcome this problem that you might not be compatible with another person later? Or you don't even know if you're going to be compatible with them later? You're married people? Okay. <laughs> I guess the married people will start on this one. Well, I, I think this kind of gets into the problem of to, to what extent can you make promises that bind your future self? And you know the values that you hold when you make that promise, you don't know if they're going to be the values that you have many years down the line. And obviously, the, the classic example would be two religious people who get married and then one of them becomes an atheist. And you know, the, since you can't, you can't really know what that commitment, whether that commitment you make that you'll be able to keep. Um, lost my train of thought. The, val you know, the values that you hold now may not be the values that you hold in the future, but hopefully you know that when you go into a marriage, if you change, then you, your partner may change in compatible ways. That's really the ultimate goal, not for two people to stay in the sort of emotional stasis for the rest of their lives where they both always value and desire exactly the same things, but that as one partner's preferences change, the other partner will be willing to explore those changes along with them. And hopefully, you know, there's no way to know in advance if you're going to get to this point or not. If that happens, though, that's how you know you have a good relationship. I actually get not just email, I mean, I mean telephone calls from people who are in that situation where they entered a relationship uh, on some terms and one of them has now changed their religious views and it's a nightmare um, and they don't know what to do about it. Uh, I, I think one of the best things that hopefully the secular or rational community has been able to do is to make some people aware that uh, life is fleeting and that my views may change. Um, Beth knows that there's some tiny, tiny, tiny possibility that I could end up uh, being a Christian at some point and when she leaves me, that's fine. Um, it's. There's an understanding uh, that I think needs to take place about this is who I am now. This is who I think I'm likely to be, um, but it could be wrong. And am I with somebody that's willing to explore that with me? And if not, we have to go into the relationship with the understanding that uh, as, as sad as it may be, sometimes relationships end and sometimes it's not sad. Sometimes it's the right thing to do for everybody. And that this doesn't necessarily, although it could, doesn't necessarily mean that you're a bad person or that you've failed. Um, but what I tell the, the people who are in these positions, uh, it is your responsibility as the individual who has changed in the relationship to own that change, but it's not your fault. And you are, should not be uh, in a position where you are uh, beaten up emotionally over this, that you are being true to yourself and that if the person actually does love you, they should love the fact that you're being true to who you are. And if that means that you have to go your separate ways, that may be the way it is. But that won't I happen to us. <laughs> <laughs> I basically agree with all of this and about you know, not, not 
expecting people to necessarily stick to promises that their future self, you know, won't feel bound by. Um, but I, I do think that, and maybe you'd agree, that there's an extent to which you can uh, bind your future self to, you know, in ways that that you want your yourself to continue being. Like, I, I think a, a misconception that I had for a while about monogamy was that it entailed like preventing yourself or preventing your partner from being with someone else who they, you know, actually wanted to be with because they, you know, were constricted by this rule that you'd set up. But it's actually a little more meta than that. You know, the conclusion that I've come to now is it's more meta than that. It's more about binding yourself to not get into a position or to reduce the chance of getting into a position where you actually want to be with someone else. So, you know, and I think that, that probably labels like uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, or, you know, the official institution of marriage just serve to further uh, reduce the chance that your future self will end up wanting something different than your current self does, and that your current self wants your future self to want. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to jump back in for, for one half second. Uh, all I can say uh, from experience uh, with regard to what's worked is I don't know what my future self's going to be, but I know that my current self has this um, passion for honesty and a desire to share that. And so when I change, I'm going, to, unless the value that changes is this passion for honesty, which would seem absurd to me, I am committed to being honest about it and let's have the actual conversation because for me, the, the relationship is built on uh, respect and openness as much or more uh, than love. Yeah, I'd actually like to uh, focus a little bit on the, yeah, and then we'll jump straight to Hannah. Um, the idea that different relationship structures might weigh in on this. So monogamy versus polyamory in particular, um, how does that affect the dynamic of pre-commitment? Um, with monogamy in particular, the idea is that you're trying to foster uh, a pre-commitment to be with one person and not, uh, I think Julia was saying, be in situations that are make, going to make you more likely to want to be with other people. Um, does polyamory give you more freedom in a good way? Does it counteract this beneficial uh, commitment? Or can it be really important to allow people to change and experience uh, different ideas as they explore their preferences? And jump straight to Hannah. Um, so I think we already really have a system in place, right, for, for evaluating differences and whether they are good or bad for the relationship, right? That's what happens when you start dating. Everyone thinks it's okay to have different values when you start dating and you come to perhaps a consensus or you agree to disagree and you understand each other and you go to right, like understand why the other person feels the way they do. And I really see no reason why that should stop um, at any point. And I, I take Max, Matt's point pretty strongly that, that your current self wants something. Um, and so your current self is making decisions about your future self. And so you, you date someone and you come to like them and and you realize that your differences are, are not in Super Bowl, and so you go ahead and you make a relationship. But then, I don't see why you should stop at that point, reevaluating at every point when people inevitably change, and you ask each other, is this still something I want to do? And I think where pre-commitment comes into that is that if your current self wants your future self to be something, then you have to increase the barriers. You have to make it harder to not be that. So while you're reevaluating at every point, or well, there's an infinite number of points, but um, at some points along the line, then it will be harder for you to change once you've done that reevaluation. So if the evaluation is, I've changed a little bit, but not enough to overcome, say, that I bound myself to you in marriage, and so it's kind of hard to get a divorce. So it's not enough to, to warrant a divorce. Um, but one day I may change enough that divorce is warranted. And so I think it really fits into exactly the same system. It's just that you're making it harder for your future self to change. And if your current self thinks that's a good idea, so be it. But that's not a reason to stop asking questions. Um, at least for me, uh, I, I like changing. Um, I, I'm 20 years old. I just turned 20. I don't, I'm not going to say the same. Um, and for me, uh, polyamory definitely gives me the freedom to, to change because all of those people are changing too and there's just like a lot of, it's almost a chaotic system, right? There's a, there's a lot of dynamics going on and allows all of us to change more. And I think polyamory also uh, requires that people assume that more change is going to happen because you have more than two people changing. 
I'll, I'll go. I can keep this fairly short. I think one of the things is that uh, I'm in complete agreement for the most part. Uh, complete for the most part. <laughs> I drank a lot last night. Um, we, I, I, think it's, I think it's best if everybody involved in the relationship, whether it's two or more, uh, attempt to come to a consensus on exactly what the nature of the relationship is and that everybody understand it and agree with it um, and that when that changes that needs to be addressed openly and honestly. Um, I, Beth and I are, are married. Um, we had a traditional and awesome ceremony. There's pictures all over her Facebook page. But it's uh, and, and currently, I uh, have no interest in partnering with anybody else. And as far as I know, she doesn't either at the moment. Um, but we haven't, we haven't necessarily excluded those options forever, because I think any time you start excluding options forever, you are demonstrating from the get-go that you are irrational, uh, that you somehow think that you can predict the future or force yourself or someone else to be something. And that, to me, just seems Bass awkward. But, but there's a trade-off, right, between cutting off flexibility, like cutting off potential things your future self might want, and uh, and like reducing the likelihood of, or how should I say this? Um, so your your current self is trying to decide what's going to make me happiest overall, and I'm going to currently leave out like the other person's happiness just to simplify, not because it's not important, mm -hmm. but just for your own happiness, you know. If you think that you're likely to get into situations where you're you know, temporarily more interested in someone else and that if you have the flexibility to go off with that other person, you're going to lose this actually wonderful relationship that would have made you much happier in the long run. If you expect that to be something that your future self might be likely to do, then the rational choice might be to sort of bind your future self and not allow it to get into situations where, I mean, cut off some flexibility. You're sacrificing flexibility for sort of overall expected happiness. Yeah, I think it's a tough call to make, but I don't think that all flexibility all the time is necessarily the optimal solution. Well, when I talk about flexibility, it's not like, um, it's, it's about, we constantly discuss, we constantly reevaluate at every point. Well, I mean, we don't spend all day talking about what we're going to do, but it's the, the opportunity to reevaluate things is always open. Um, I just don't find it that likely, at least now, that, it, that things are going to go that way. Yeah. Actually, Adam, I wanted to bring up something that you and I had been talking about, um, this idea that there is some amount that we perhaps should be seeking out temptation versus not allowing ourselves to be too tempted. Um, I know we might be uh, making fun of some of the prohibitions at, I think it was Brigham Young or, or Liberty University, that won't allow women in the car with men alone because, who knows, that might lead to dancing. But. <laughs> So we, we look at that and we say it's absurd, people can resist temptation, but it seems like the same principle, just a different matter of degree, uh, how much we are trying to uh, allow ourselves to be tempted. Um, I, I know you had some thoughts on this, Adam. Well, um, everything, that, everything that social scientists have, have researched about the brain leads us to believe that self-control works like a muscle. If you exercise it too, sorry, can you hear me? Self-control works like a muscle. If you exercise it too much, then it gets fatigued and you can't use it anymore. If you don't exercise it at all, then when you need it there, you don't have it. So for instance, you know, if you're dieting, the classic example is don't keep junk food in the house. Dieting, you know, it's hard. It's really hard to lose weight. And one of the reasons for that, uh, as Julia mentioned earlier, is this like evolutionary appetite for fatty and sugary foods. If you constantly expose yourself to that temptation and you make it available, sooner or later your self-control will fatigue, you won't be able to resist it anymore. But on the other hand, if you never give yourself an opportunity to exercise self-control, then sooner or later you're going to need it and you don't have it. You've, ne you've never like flexed that muscle, you've never strengthened it. And I think that's, that's my biggest objection to programs like you know, the one at Brigham Young or other religious schools like that. If you try to shelter people from all temptation, if you try to make sure there's never a, sit a situation where they have a chance to do the wrong thing, well, sooner or later, they are going to have the chance to do the wrong thing, and they have no willpower because they've never needed to have willpower. Well, I think that's what's so helpful about pre-commitment, right? Getting, getting married to someone, um, my understanding is that doesn't mean you lock them in a box, right? They can still see other people. Um, I hope. Um, <laughs> I mean, people do all sorts of things. Um, 
Don't judge my box marriage. <laughs> Consent isn't everything. Anyway, so, um, right, so the idea of pre-commitment, I think, is the idea that you are tethering yourself to somebody, in this case marriage, right, that you care about, and that you are sort of putting social and emotional bonds on yourself, but not uh, physical ones. Um, unlike the ball and chain metaphor, um, you, don't, you do still see other people of the, of the gender or sex you, you, you prefer, and therefore you do have to exercise self-control. So pre-commitment doesn't eliminate the need to exercise self-control, as we know from married people who cheat on their spouses. Um, it just means that you have even stronger legal, emotional, social incentives to hold by them, and therefore make yourself, make your future self the self the current self wants to be in the future. <laughs> there we go. Um, um, if I could I draw a map like primer. <laughs> yeah. A phrase that I never thought I would say uh, about don't judge my box marriage. <laughs> 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 Certainly not on a stage. Um, how much do you think relationships rely solely on the consent of the people involved? Um, and how much do you think society can or should judge other people's relationships? I know that it's a really common belief that you should let consenting adults do what they like. Um, and I don't know that that's been fully examined, especially when we look at times we do uh, disagree with the idea of, say, um, polygamy and perhaps other relationships where there seems to be consent, but we do want to cast judgment, perhaps. I, I don't know. It seems like we're actually talking about two different things, because if you ask me, uh, how much does consent weigh on a relationship? It's 100%. Uh, there's nothing. But is it enough, right? Is, 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 is the like, verbal consent of the parties in the relationship sufficient for us to say, I don't know, legally and ethically are sort of different questions, but to say, like, okay, then whatever you're doing is fine and we won't like, try to intervene? Is that the question you're asking, ah, Jesse? Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, that's a harder question. <laughs> I didn't bring up here to answer easy ones. <laughs> I, uh, wow. I think we define, we, we, we've done a pretty decent job, I think, of defining this uh, as like consenting adults so that we draw a particular line so that just because you managed to get a 12 year old to consent, um, we don't necessarily count that the same. So I think it's, it's clear that there are situations where society has uh, a moral obligation to actually step in um, and weigh in on these things. But those seem to be in extremes, I would say, and that by and large, among consenting adults, um, I, I don't know I don't know that much more that consent matters. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think that we we judge we should judge consent by a rational ideal that there are some things that a person of sound mind simply could not consent to. Um, I believe there was an example of a person who posted a personal ad uh, asking for someone who wanted to be killed and eaten. I think some of you may remember this story. And I think we rightly judge that this is something that no rational person could possibly consent to. So I think just because a person says yes doesn't make that enough. I think we also have to, you know, I don't want to sound too authoritarian, but I think we also have to ask the question of can people consent to things that are not in their own best interest. And I think sometimes society does have a role to play like particularly in these very patriarchal religious communities um, where po uh, polygamous marriage is kind of the norm and where women are sort of treated as property and given to the, the wealthiest or the most influential men. And a lot of the women, if you ask them, they might actually say that they consented to this because you know, this was what their, their God and their family and their culture taught them they had to do. And maybe it doesn't work to say, this is, you know, your consent is wrong, we're not going to let you make this decision. Maybe sometimes there's, there's um, cases where intervening does more harm than good. But I think we shouldn't start from the principle that anything a person says yes to must be okay. I think there are times when we have to say there are things that people cannot consent to. Yeah, I'm totally on board with that. To clarify, when I made the joke earlier and I said consent isn't everything, I meant like it may not be sufficient, not it's not important. Um, part one. Uh, part two, I think... I actually think there's more than that. I think that certainly when, when it seems like rational people could never consent to something, society might step in. But I think there are cases that are even tougher and even harder where consent is simply not sufficient. Um, there are these red flags where we question more. Things like um, a, a large age gap between people in a relationship, uh, especially if one person is, a, is 
fairly young, let's say not a minor, to, to allow for legal issues. But I think it is right, not that we necessarily intervene or necessarily dismiss, but that we question more, that those people have to be held to a higher standard because there is more potential for harm. And I think friends, people who know a, a couple or triad or polycule well, um, <laughs> have the responsibility to be stepping in, and again, not intervening, not ripping people apart, but questioning, because certain activities um, require a higher standard of proof that they are safe and happy for people. And we're rationalists. We know people make really bad decisions. And if our friends are making the same bad decisions, not just like they'll get their heart broken, but something really bad is going to happen to them. Something incredibly emotionally painful is going to happen to them if they keep making the same decisions. And when something is going to hurt both or all people in the relationship, I think it's time really to, to say, that's great that you consent to this. You need to provide more proof that this is going to be a good idea. Can I, can I jump in there? I think, I think the term you're looking for is enthusiastic consent. I, this is something that uh, the feminist theory has come up with that I think is a really good idea, that if people say yes, but they say yes, you know, under duress or reluctantly or just, you know, to get the other person to give in, to get, to give in and get the other person to stop bothering them, then maybe we should say that's not enough to constitute consent. There needs to be a higher standard where it's clear that the person is going along with what's happening, not just reluctantly, but enthusiastically and, you know, maybe even joyfully. Yeah, but I'm saying something even more than that. I'm saying two really enthusiastic 18-year-olds who want to elope and run away to Alaska <laughs> maybe shouldn't, even though they're 18 and they're adults. Maybe their parents or friends should step in and say, you are making what is potentially a bad decision and you have the responsibility to provide better evidence that you can take care of yourself in that situation. I definitely, oh, sorry. Go, no, go ahead, you haven't talked. Okay. Um, I definitely agree in principle and I, would, I wouldn't want to endorse a, a policy that said that as long as two to adults gave their explicit consent, then no one should try to intervene at all. I don't want to endorse that, but I also still feel really uncomfortable at the idea of having a policy where we can judge, um, we can judge that you know no rational person could possibly actually really want that thing that that person says that they want. Just because I, you know, we know we've seen again and again, and scientists have shown again and again that people overestimate their ability to, uh, to understand other people's preferences and experiences and that we you know, project our own preferences and experiences uh, and reactions onto other people. And you know, I, I can think of a lot of examples where many or most people in society would say, uh, well, for example, you know, no, like a woman can't possibly actually enjoy commitment-free sex. Like she must, she must really want a relationship with a guy. She must actually be hurt or feel bad about herself if she's willing to have casual sex. And you know, I can if if that's how they and like other people they've known feel, then I can understand why they would be tempted to project that onto the you know woman in question and say, well, she can't really want that. You know, deep down she's just confused or insecure or you know self-loathing or something like that. Um, and that's true of poly relationships too. I've heard that again and again that, uh, you know, you, especially women in poly relationships, but just in general, people in poly relationships can't really be happy. They must actually be jealous or, you know, heartbroken that their partners are seeing other, par other people or, you know, the women especially must be, you know, doing it because the guy wants them to and they're being coerced in some emotional way. Um, so there's just so many failure modes of this policy. And, but I, I don't know what the right level of intervention to advocate is. I think, you know, when I, when I originally talked about this a little while ago, I talked about that it's probably the extremes where I would say that society had some obligation to jump in, which is why uh, I'm not quite sure that I actually understood what you were saying, which is this idea of two 18-year-olds wanting to elope and people having an obligation to say that's a bad idea and telling them that they needed to provide some better evidence. Evidence for what? For, for who? Because my position is to err on the side of freedom. They are adults who are consenting. Adults are, are and should be allowed to, to make mistakes and society should intervene only when there's some compelling interest uh, to prevent you know, serious harm, not just to teenagers eloping. So I think... Uh, Can I just respond? Sure. Yeah, no, I, I'm definitely on board with that. What, what I meant was higher standard than, than any... If you have some, some abstract couple, right? We'll, we'll call that the, like, 
sort of math, the platonic ideal of a couple. Um, and then if you have a couple, or whatever it is, um, that falls outside that standard in such a way that you think there is higher possibility for harm, I think there is, in terms of your approval, giving your approval, of course the 18 year olds can run off, they can do whatever they want, but in terms of me as a friend, and I think the friend is important because I hope that friends would be better at uh, analyzing their needs and preferences and motivations, though they're not always, um, my approval would be contingent on a slightly higher knowledge of like, let's say it's my, it's my girlfriend, right, who is, who is gonna run off with a guy. Um, I would want to know the guy in order to give my approval. She can still do it. She's still an adult, but a uh, slightly higher, higher standard of evidence if there's a higher possibility for harm. Yeah, and I think that goes to questions of prior assumptions and prior probabilities where we say if 95% of the time that two 18-year-olds elope, they later report regretting it and wishing somebody had stopped them. In those cases, shouldn't we as a society look at that and say, oh no, this looks like a case that they will end up regretting. Um, how much do we weigh autonomy versus this sense that, ooh, this tends to go poorly and we don't want our friends to be in pain? Um, it's not going to be settled in half an hour, or mm -hmm. however, I think we have about 20 minutes, um, but do you have any way to weigh in on this? Can, can I just jump in and uh, vent my frustration at this common thing I hear people say, which is that, well, you can't know for sure, therefore you don't know anything. You have, like, you, you have no expectation about what the true answer is. And, and so, you know, even though I was advocating like, as a policy, you know, being hands off with the understanding that you're probably you know, worse at understanding other people's psychology than you think you are, um, that's sort of as a policy. Epistemically, like in terms of what you should actually expect is true about the world, if it is the case that 90% you know, of the time, I'm pulling this number out of thin air, but if it is the case that 90% of the time, uh, you know, women in poly relationships actually are uncomfortable with it and, and did feel emotionally coerced or manipulated in some way, then it is a reasonable expectation for people to have, you know, even if a woman says, no, I'm really happy, you know, if that's what all the women say and 95% of them are actually, you know, unhappy, then it's not unreasonable for you to have a, a more confidence in the fact that she's unhappy. It just might be unreasonable for you to act on that. I agree. Uh, and, and actually, after clarifying the confusion a minute ago, where you were talking about for you to give your consent versus maybe some kind of uh, legal action or society stepping in. So I, I think we're, we're kind of on the same page with that. Um, so, okay. I don't know what else I was going to say. I guess in a quick follow-up for you, Matt, is there any level of expectation that we should step in legally? I think we do that with minors. Um, in various states, it's different ages, but um, clearly we're comfortable using legal power in some cases. Why do you think that principle is, and is it at an appropriate level? Yeah, I, I don't, I, th I think it's one of those things that we're, we continue to work on and kind of refine. I uh, you know we get more and more information. I'm completely in agreement with Julia that this idea that because you don't ever know everything means you, you know nothing is absurd that just that that is one of the things that drives me crazy as well and it's it goes to the limits i've talked about this when when talking about secular morality um the idea that you don't necessarily know the best answer doesn't mean that you know nothing about it and can't then assess a situation i think that we're doing a, a pretty good job in a lot of areas but I think the best thing that we're doing is recognizing that we can do better and we should refine the way that we go about making decisions on these things based on ration, or reason and evidence and things like that. Um, one of the things that we've touched on a couple times is vows and the labels and um, sort of predetermined models of relationships that people have an expectation of monogamy or marriage or even uh, certain expectations of somebody who accepts the label of a boyfriend. And uh, what do you think the benefits of these labels are in terms of signaling to people, and how do they do harm? Well, I think they can do harm in the sense that a lot of them are tied to ideas of property, uh, uh, very narrow views of ownership, and I I've, I've struggled with this a little bit. Um, Beth's my wife. And when I say that, there are people who can go, oh, he's bought into this ancient patriarchal system of ownership and he's now labeled his property. And I prefer to say, no, I'm her husband. And 
there's, there's an equality there. We're using conventional labels and we are trying to use them in a way that demonstrates that they don't have to mean this idea of property. Um, our commitment to each other, the vows that, that we made, we don't need rings. We didn't need the government to come in and say that we're married. We didn't need the approval of the people who attended the ceremony. We didn't even need Aaron to officiate it, although I'm damn glad he did. Um, all we needed was our honest, enthusiastic consent to one another. Why did we choose to go this route of a more traditional um, method? And uh, it may just be that, well, I, would, I was gonna, getting ready to say that maybe that I'm just a little old fashioned, but it was actually Beth who cared more about having the ceremony and stuff than I did. I'd have gone down to the justice of the peace. Um, I, I think that it sends a statement and we talked about it at our wedding, that it's about more than us, that these types of relationships, whether they're monogamous or polyamorous, they're still about building communities, communities of different sizes and interacting with the people. And we wanted to make sure that the, the people that we cared about knew that we had made this commitment, not because it makes it necessarily bind, binds us tighter, it might, um, but because we wanted to share that portion of our lives with the people that we cared about, and it was a good excuse to have a really cool party. <laughs> Definitely the, the best part of a wedding is just throwing a party for maybe, you know, 100, 200 of your closest friends. <laughs> I, think, I think labels have value insofar as they communicate to other people the way you see yourself. And I think the same thing is true maybe about the label atheist. You know, it, it says something important about your worldview. It says something about how you want other people to view you. And I think the same is true of marriage. But of course, the potential downside to this is that the existence of labels kind of creates pressure on people to fall into a few neatly defined categories. And I think, you know, there are plenty of people who maybe don't believe in God but don't want to call themselves atheists. And I don't want to tell them they have to label themselves that way. And similarly, there are people who want maybe to make a long-term commitment to their partners but don't want to get married because they don't like, you know, the, the patriarchal, like, property assumptions built into that ceremony. And I certainly wouldn't want to tell them that their commitment is less real or less valid than mine just because they, you know, they don't choose to commemorate it in the same way. Um, sorry. Uh, I, I think that's a great point about labels. Uh, pushing people into sort of preset boxes of, of here, are the, here are the choices of relationship model I can have. Um, and I think that uh, the status quo bias that I talked about in my talk uh, applies a lot to, when, to the process of thinking about what relationship works best. And, and I, here I don't mean status quo of like what relationship you happen to currently be in, but what happens to be the default relationship mode in your you know, culture or your community. So you know, discussions about monogamy and polyamory often take monogamy as the default, the privileged hypothesis, because it's the status quo, um, and then you, know, you, would, you would need some sort of special reason to adopt a polyamorous relationship or an open relationship of some kind. Um, and in fact, that's the stage to which most people never even get. They don't even consider other hypotheses but beyond the, the status quo of monogamy. So yeah, I mean, having labels and associated assumptions of what that label entails definitely uh, reinforces the status quo bias and keeps people from maybe choosing relationship models that would be better for them personally. Um, that said, I think there is you know, a fair bit to say in favor of labels, uh, not least of which is the fact that they're like much more convenient to use in conversation. <laughs> I mean, it's like a sounds like a small thing, but you know, I, I have felt frustrated sometimes when people don't want to use a label uh, like boyfriend, but clearly like the relationship that they have is like right in the center of the cluster of things that we refer to as boyfriend girlfriend relationships, and like you just might as it's just so much quicker than saying this person who I feel excited about when I think about and who I am attracted to and enjoy having sex with and intend to spend a long time uh, a portion of my life with etc cetera, etc cetera. like we have words for a reason um, <laughs> but <laughs> but <Can> I, uh, <laughs> I, I I also wanted to add Matt that I uh, not that I thought you were committing this uh, fallacy but that I often hear people commit the fallacy of you know well it's you know, it's irrational to just like 
marriage because of the idea of it. You know, I, I don't have a good reason to like it, you know, so it's irrational. Maybe I'll do it anyway, but, you know, it's still irrational. It's not, it's yeah. not necessarily irrational. Like, yeah. you, you can like something or not like something. You can have, you know, feel warm fuzzies about a concept or not. And that's not irrational any more than liking chocolate ice cream and not liking vanilla is irrational or the other way around. Um, yes. And it is, in fact, rational instrumentally in terms of trying to, you know, get more of what you value in life. If you know that you feel happy when you think about the idea of being married, then the rational thing to do, you know, yeah. all else equal, is to it's be a, married so you can experience more happiness. That's the same example I was going to use. As a, I, I, lo I love <laughs> ice cream. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> but there's a quick, quick story on this point about labels, because uh, this is my favorite story. Um, Beth has a relative who refused for a long time to refer to me as her boyfriend or uh, now won't refer to me as her husband, does not seem to acknowledge that I'm a person. And she's extremely religious, and of course they are incredibly hung up on sex. And so when talking to Beth one time, she referred to me as that man who gives you sexual pleasure. <laughs> I'm putting that shit on a fucking t-shirt and wearing it to the family reunion. That is the best ever. Yeah, that's a that's a good story. Um, <laughs> I like that. We should all get those T-shirts. Um, so, I'm really on board with with, with Julia in terms of uh, using labels f for other people because they are useful. Uh, when I was in tenth grade, I was for, because I don't know. I was so uncomfortable with this idea of possession, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, that I didn't let my boyfriend at the time call me that, um, and it was really like pretty dumb. <laughs> like I regret that now. Um, in terms of how we see it ourselves, like throw those damn scripts out. Like they're useless. I, I think there's so much wrong with the way that we see what being a boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or husband has to be, that they're almost completely useless. They are worth starting from scratch and asking your partner or partners what it is that they want and you want and using it only as a convenient tool for labeling what it is to other people. I'm going to object slightly uh, to that. Just, I, I, I generally agree um, about, I mean, as I said, I agree about the importance of like just asking, focusing on your case, what would make you happiest, not which of the predetermined models do you like best. Um, but, you know, there, there is some evidence contained in the fact that one model is much more popular than others. And it's not, it's not necessarily always a ton of evidence because sometimes you know why one model is more popular and it's because you know judeo-christian values reign supreme and like you, there had to be single pairing monogamous pairings in order for the system to work and so that doesn't the fact then that it's the dominant one doesn't necessarily provide you with that much evidence that it's the one that makes everyone the happiest um so i guess i'm just stating a general principle that uh i wouldn't throw the traditional model out the window without first asking, is there, any, is there any valuable information I can learn from the fact that it is the traditional model? And maybe sometimes the answer is not much, but I think it's good to at least ask. Agreed, but you know, not much, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, running short on time, all right. Um, I know Matt and Adam, you both had ceremonies and uh, performed rituals and had vows that you wrote yourselves for, for them. Um, <laughs> sacrifice what now? Uh, what do you think the importance of ritual and ceremony is? Why did you choose to have them, and what did they end up meaning to you? Um, well, as I said, I, I think the, the importance of ritual is that I think it's perfectly okay to commemorate important transitions in life. And I think this is one of the few things that religion gets right and that humanist and atheist community should learn to emulate. That when you, when you go through a major inflection point in your life, you know, a, a coming of age, a marriage, a birth, a death, that I think it's perfectly acceptable and appropriate for the community to acknowledge this. And, you know, for them, sort of like for you to declare your intentions to the community to say this is the change I'm going through, and then for the community in turn to say we acknowledge this change and we'll, we'll support you in it, we'll help you through it. I think, I think that's really the value of marriage is to like declare your intentions and to ask people to come together to support you. Yeah, and I, I wasn't kidding that one of the primary reasons for doing this was so that we could have a fun party. Um, but I'm, 
in my transition from being a fundamentalist Christian to being an absolute enemy of Christianity, um, I had to struggle with what I was going to keep and what I was going to jettison. You know, do I give them all the good curse words? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> uh, do I keep, do I stop using words like belief? Absolutely not. Um, and I'll have an argument with somebody later, I think, about uh, belief versus knowledge and which is actually more important. Not you. I, I didn't mean to look at you on that. But, um, it's, yeah, we could. We could. Um, but rituals are who we are, and they're not all bad, and I think they provide a lot of good. I would say, how many people have been to every Skepticon? How many people have been to four of them? How many people have been to three of them? You're becoming gradually entrenched in ritual. <laughs> this is my first. I want to make this a ritual. And it's because it... All right. Thank you, Springfield. Uh, that wasn't for the easy applause line. It's because rituals have some value in, in, in keeping us on the track that we value and sharing that with other people. Yes, you can do stupid rituals too, but I, I think you keep, I've said before, when it comes to religion or anything, keep the good, jettison the crap, and get on with living. What can we learn from the way religion approaches relationships and marriage? So what good is there? Uh, what, I mean, we know that there's some crap we want to jettison. Uh, what do you think we should keep and learn from? Nothing. <laughs> a tough one. Well, re first of all, religion isn't one thing. Um, so there's as many different views on what religions have to say about relationship as there are people, probably. Um, I think we can pretty much jettison most of the crap um, because the very ideas, I mean, I, I just speak primarily about Christianity, first of all. Uh, it's, it's, its idea of marriage isn't about monogamy in the first place. Um, and it's not about polyamory as we've been discussing it amongst, uh, you know, equals and partners. It's about, hey, I'm the boss and I got lots of women and you're going to give me your daughter in exchange for land. Um, and these are, you know, my prop Those types of things, obviously, we can jettison. I don't know. I, think, I try to think back to the, the Christian ceremonies that I went to and the people who are in Christian marriages that I know. I don't know that there's anything about their religion in the relationship that I want to keep that didn't probably come from somewhere outside the, the religion in the first place. So I don't necessarily advocate this, but um, do you guys know Leo Libresco? No? Really? Oh, she's awesome. I know she's the enemy now, but um, she's a, <laughs> she was an atheist turned Catholic blogger on Patheos. She runs a blog called Unequally Yoked. And she wrote a really intriguing set of blog posts on advocating for non-Christians to engage in covenantal marriage, which involves basically making it almost impossible for you to exit this. That's a little scary. Again, not advocating. But if you are someone who has found someone who you think makes you a better person across the board, if you think they literally make you the kind of person you more want to be and will continue to do that in the future, and that it is hard for you to be a good person without them, then it might not be a bad idea to yoke yourself as strenuously as possible to them. I, I don't have a great answer to this, but there's, I can, I can see there being something about the Christian worldview or, I don't know, just generally religious worldviews that puts a relationship or a marriage in a larger, awe-inspiring context and that there are humanist, secular equivalents of that. Um, like the, so I alluded earlier to this um, passage of Anne Druyan, I think is how you say her name, Druyan, uh, talking about her relationship with Carl Sagan and she said that people uh, frequently used to and still sometimes do ask her about you know, whether Carl was a, a deathbed uh, conversion um, and whether she expected to see him again in the afterlife. And she, of course, said, no, you know, I, I don't expect to see him again in the afterlife. Um, Carl and I were always very 
aware and accepting of the fact that death seems to be final and you know that we don't expect to ever reunite again in some afterlife but understanding that death was final didn't prevent us from feeling just incredibly like awe-inspiringly lucky at having connected with each other at least just this once you know and when they they talked about how or she talked about how when they thought about just the vastness of time and space and the fact that just pure blind uh you know non-intentional chance gave them this amazing relationship um that that put their relationship in this in this really beautiful awe-inspiring context that was really what made me tear up when i read it um so that's you know i think that accomplishes i think to a greater degree accomplishes better uh the sort of thing that religion might be trying to do when they put marriages in the context of you know what god wants you to do and how you're best serving him we are coming to the end with just a couple minutes and i'd like to give each of the four panels a chance to offer some closing thoughts um ideas that you might not have gotten to say or points you disagreed with so you could get a last shot uh, without much chance of response um i see matt furiously scribbling but uh i don't know Uh, I'll love who you want to love, however you want to love, as long as they're willing to go along with it. Um, you get to decide what you're going to do. Um, I, I don't want to make the kind of blase, or blase point that, that there's no right or wrong. There is, and that sometimes things are going to go bad. It's how you start off the relationship and how you communicate throughout that relationship as long as you're honestly representing what's going on. I suspect that things will tend to be a lot easier and if you're one of those people who are lucky enough to find a whole bunch of people who want to sleep with you well good for you <laughs> i mean you know I, I give you know we can talk about it later but I, it's it's steering your own ship and doing so based on reason is what i think we uh, and by that i'm talking about the skeptic humanists are all about. Um, this is really within the same vein, but uh, it, it really continually breaks my heart. Um, every time I hear stories of people I don't know, or even more acutely my friends, who, who tell me stories about their bad experiences with relationships and sex and marriage and all of those things. Um, can't believe I have friends who are married, but, um, <laughs> and especially when it comes down to something like, I expected it to be this way, and it wasn't, but we never talked about it. Or they wanted something that I couldn't give, but we never talked about it. Or I thought, I thought we could work this out, but we never figured out how. Because that's fixable, right? If, if we reconsider what relationships should be like, which is a building of a structure from the ground up that satisfies both or all members, that makes everyone as happy as possible, that makes everyone the best person they can be, then maybe we can really achieve something. I think reason is a tool to get what you want, but it's, it's only a tool. It shouldn't be the be all and end all of your life. And I think there's, there is a quote from Carl Sagan. I don't know the exact wording. I'm probably gonna butcher it, but he said, in, in the vastness of this universe and of space and time, the only thing that really binds us together and the only thing that really makes our lives meaningful is love. And it can be love of another person or it can be love of an, ab an abstract ideal of beauty, of pleasure, but love is really what I think what makes our lives meaningful and reason is just the tool we should use to figure out how to get the most of it that we can. I talked earlier about this ideal that I find very inspiring of being intellectually honest and open to changing your mind and treating disagreements as opportunities to work together to figure out what's true as opposed to battles that you can win. Um, and I think that's especially useful in relationships, uh, having the mindset of trying to figure out what's true, uh, especially in you know, emotionally fraught situations and, and being mindful of the fact that your initial impulses and reactions and judgments might be biased and often are. Um, being open to questioning 
the things that your your brain is telling you about uh, how the other person was wrong or how you were right or uh, you know being open to question the sort of naive realism that tells you that how things appear to you initially is how they really fundamentally objectively are. Um, I think it's not recognized often enough how useful those those rationality tools that are are usually described as tools for you know figuring out the world around you. How useful those tools are for having uh, really fulfilling relationships too. Let's thank the panelists. I've had a fantastic time. Thank you all so much. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to have this panel. Um, tricky subject, and I think we got all the answers, so. Solved all the problems today. Solved them all. Now you all have no excuse for not having amazing relationships. We gave you all the answers. <laughs>